What I'm doing is I'm running our data loader on a PC. Uh, this PC has uh, a LAN connection to the LAN in the office here. And then it also has an uh, AFDX board installed in it, an AFDX end system interface, and a connection to an AFDX network. On the AFDX network and the LAN network, we have basically another PC running a simulation of a loadable target. Uh, so that we're going to basically be operating this against a simulated loadable target on an AFDX network and it's also accessible via the LAN uh, in our office network here. So first thing, I'm in the GUI uh, part of the, the data loader development kit right now and if I want to do a find operation, very simple, a right click and I get my find operation window here. Uh, if you wait just a minute, I gotta switch over here and make sure my simulated target is running. So, when I do my find operation in the GUI, I have to specify an IP address uh, that I want to send it to. In this case, I'm not going to broadcast it because I'm on the office network. I'm just going to send it to a unicast address to the machine that I know is running um, running the, the simulated data loader. And I'm going to send it to the well-known uh, for find UDP port. The timeout that I set here is basically how long I'm going to wait for responses from loadable targets on the network. So I'm going to go ahead and start it here. And after five seconds, I will see, hopefully, that some targets responded. So, uh, on the simulated uh, system I have out there, I'm basically emulating six different targets here, and you can see they've responded. They've given me identification information in the IAN message, and I also know the IP address that they responded from by inspecting the source address of the message, the UDP message that was received. So, now that I've found those targets, they're available to do load operations on the network. <clears throat> so before I do an operation, I'm going to go back and look at some of the settings here so we can see how these targets are, um, some of the configuration settings that would be stored, if, if you remember back a couple slides, in say that XML um, files that were referred to um, in the diagram. So I have an entry here for each of the targets that were found on the network, and I have identifying information and I also have, uh, in the last three columns here, some Airing 615A level uh, protocol configuration information. One is the version of Airing 615A uh, that that target is utilizing. So in this case, they're all 615A2. Uh, there's also an older A1 version of the spec and a newer A-3 version of the spec. So uh, we allow in the configuration information to specify which version um, the target, basically, of the protocol the target adheres to. At the 615A level, we can set a retry count. So if you remember from the diagrams, the 615A messages are sent in TFTP file transfers. So this retry count is, say, if we request uh, an LUI file and the file transfer fails, it's how many times we'll retry to read that file. And then the timeout uh, at this level, at the 615A level, is basically how long the data loader expects to wait between receiving one of the status files. So if you remember the information, and upload operation uh, flows that we looked at, the target is periodically sending these LUS or LCS files to notify the data loader that it's alive and well. And so this timeout is how long the data loader waits between receiving one of those status files and declaring that the target is essentially dead and, and not available anymore. Uh, the data loader, for its connection to each target, also has to utilize a TFTP client and a TFTP server. So if we look at the TFTP client and server, uh, we have several configuration operations. So one is, uh, say for a server, we define a range of UDP ports that that server will use. Um, so a server has to be able to basically service multiple um, file transfers simultaneously. So we give it a range of, of UDP ports to use uh, for those. Then we have uh, a series of the options that can be negotiated at the TFTP level. So this port option, if we select that, what that would allow is a server to negotiate a well-known port or basically the port where file transfers are started between it and a client. So there's a standard defined well-known port of 59, which is used for to initiate file transfers in the data load protocols. But there's also an option where the target and the data loader side can renegotiate that once an operation is started um, so that it, uh, the file transfers can be initiated on some port other than the well-known or default port of 59. The block size, we have it set to zero here um, so that we use the default block size of 512, but we can also specify uh, a different block size, say 1K, um, 
of, and this is the size, the chunks that the files are broken up into as they are sent in individual UDP messages across the network. We can also negotiate a max file size. So if a client or server can only handle a file of a certain size, there's an option to basically exchange the information about the size of the file before the file transfer begins, and if it's too large, then one side can opt out of the transfer or not. The, uh, the data in operate uh, option is, a, is for a when a, I'm sorry, when a TFTP client initiates a write request to write a file to a server, um, if it's a really small uh, file, say less than a block, one block size, so less than 512 bytes, um, if the data in option is used, this allows the, the server, or I'm sorry, the client side, to send all of the data of the file along with the write request. Uh, basically just makes the protocol go faster. Then also the timeout, the TFTP timeout option can be negotiated between the client and the server or we can uh, define a default size. In this configuration here, I have everything set to zero, which basically means we're not negotiating it, we're using the defaults. I'm going to load up host LAN configuration here. So, okay, so if we go back now to our simulated target, um, we are going to execute an information operation uh, where we're going to retrieve the configuration information from my simulated target. So I have to go over here and activate my target, if you can hold on for one second. And so I now have a target ready and waiting, and I'm going to refresh. So I've now requested information from the target, and I'm getting status here. He's replying with um, accepted. And I, the, the status received in the log below here, you can think of that as um, each one of these entries signals that I've received one of those status files, so in this case LCS files from the target. And then when I get the information in the window here, I've received the LCL or the standard formatted uh, configuration information from the target. Okay? So I could also go and do this operation towards an Ethernet target. Uh, let's see. And if I do it with the Ethernet target, uh, let's see, I want to make sure, I want to capture some of the data uh, using Wireshark. So I just have Wireshark sniffing the LAN interface on the data loader here. And I'm going to kick off over the standard Ethernet interface, the operation. And you can see in Wireshark here um, what's actually going on on the wire. So this would coincide with what we looked at in the, the flow charts for the information operation. So let's watch, let the operation complete here. Okay. And if we go back and we look at our Wireshark capture, we can see, if we just go through the sequence, that in the first entry here, uh, a TFTP read request for the LCI file was sent from the data loader, which is at IP address uh, 1.83, to the loadable target at 1.81. And you can see we're trying to negotiate some of the options here. The target responds with the data packet, and it's less than 512 bytes, so we know it's the last one. The data loader then acknowledges that packet, and we have our first complete TFTP file transfer. After that, you can see here that basically from here on, the data loader has gone into TFTP server mode. So we see the first thing, uh, the target requests to write the LCS or the status file to the data loader, uh, executes that file TFTP file transfer, then sends another status file, then another status file, and you can see they're being sent periodically, then a fourth status file, and then finally, while that status file is being transferred simultaneously, it sends the configuration information in an LCL file, and then once the LCL file transfer is completed, the target side sends a final LCS file indicating to the data loader that the operation is complete. So we just have a view here of sort of what's going on on the wire uh, as the operation executes. Okay. So that's an information operation. If we go back and we do, uh, let's see here, an upload operation. Got to start it on my simulated target. So an upload operation is done from this pane in the, the data loader window. The first thing we have to do is we have to select a loadable media set.
So I can see here I have a media set like we talked about before uh, in the slides on Airing 665. And at the root directory of the media set, I have a loads.lum and a files.lum. So if I select the loads file, that's, that's going to list all of the loadable uh, software parts on the media set. And I'll see that I get three of them, each in, um, specified uh, by a different header file in that media set, are loaded up and ready to be um, loaded to the target. I can verify these by clicking this uh, the checkbox next to those. So what that means is, um, if we go back to uh, look at our media set, uh, if you remember, the files.lum and the header files that are part of uh, the constituent uh, loadable software parts all contain CRC information about the files on the media set. So by selecting the verify, I can tell the data loader that before it initiates the operation to go through and actually itself calculate the CRCs of the actual files and then check them against the CRCs registered in the header file and the LUM files to basically ensure the validity of the media before I start the load. Okay, So once I start a load, pretty uh, pretty boring operation at that point. Uh, basically we have file transfer progress bars that show us the uh, the status of the transfer as it's ongoing and um, so it's, at this point it's basically um, the data loader here is acting as a, a uh, file uh, transfer server and the data loader side is requesting files and we're showing you the progress of the operations as they're ongoing. So I think this is a pretty long a uh, load here could take several minutes. So, so that's that's the user interface to the 615A data loader. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have a command line interface. So, showing a console here in Windows. So, if I do the help for it, you can see we have a command line interface, which is going to provide the uh, several options to do uh, an Ethernet find uh, or a find over the 664 network. Uh, also, we can initiate information operations and upload operations um, from the command line. So, pretty simple, same operations that we were just showing in the GUI, but you can initiate it from a command line so we can support uh, batch, uh, batched files or like shell scripts to do repetitive operations over and over again. Um, also, as I had mentioned, uh, we have we have the uh, tool set when in here we have APIs uh, fully defined APIs we can look at a sample here um, so that you could develop your own application using high-level uh, functions to do uh, data load operations 